that was quick. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mikias Grimic. Uh, I am a, re a senior researcher and a professor at Riga Studies University. I am scientist to the core, so I am not really an inspirational speaker, so, so don't expect a lot of inspirations. Uh, but you can expect a case study of what we think we have done right in our attempts to communicate science. So, uh, once more, as I said, I'm a researcher um, and uh, I'm, I'm particularly focused on a very specific topic, which is maybe not very relevant, but for the particular example I will show you, it is actually relevant. So, what I have been doing for the last 10 or so years, I have been studying agri-food systems, which is a very large and, and very broad topic. And so, I have been focusing on uh, transition, on transition towards more sustainable, and more efficient and more uh, uh, healthy food systems that can support uh, consumers and can actually support producers. And the case study uh, come is very recent. So just during the last couple of years, we have been building this network of ambassadors, network of people, uh, because at some point we realized that it's very difficult for us to communicate scientific results because, well, as it was said just a moment ago, uh, journals are interested in particular things and we don't always have the particular things and also we cannot always uh, make sure that even if journalists uptake what we have to say it doesn't lead to transition we need we actually want to see that our research results make an impact so that's why we decided that uh, we need to build this ambassador network and uh, basically what we have done with this ambassador network is we have used it to share our research results directly we have used it to get some feedback on what actually is needed by people on the ground on uh, who is working with change in food systems. And we have actually used it to initiate new initiatives and spread some seed funding to make sure that actually people who are interested, that they receive the money and they actually build up new initiatives. Uh, however, that's not the full story. Of course, uh, usually when you have something like this, you need the initial funding. So. It wasn't exactly that we decided that we just want to do it. There was a call, there was, as, as it usually is, there was some projects that allowed us to actually get this initial kick. And uh, namely, in this case, this was Europe, uh, Horizon Europe call. Uh, and uh, this particular call wasn't this very direct research call, but instead it was uh, coordination and support action. I don't know, do you know what it means, but basically it means that Currently, quite often, uh, Europe, uh, European projects doesn't just come saying, like, you have to research this. They are saying, well, you have to research, but then you also have to reach out to potential users of this knowledge, and you have to make sure that they learn something from that. And this was that type of research, uh, research project, where they said, yes, collect, please, the best practices that can change the food systems, but then also ensure that there is improved sustainability performance among your target groups, and that there is... Um, uh, change in how farmers are positioned within the supply chain, which is sort of a very technical thing to communicate to you the, this particular aspect that we have to change how farmers are positioned, but it will make a sense why I'm pointing that out in a moment. So I think that for you to understand where our challenge with this task lied is uh, to, to think a little bit what uh, how we envision where farmers are in this supply chain. And namely, when we talk about food, and when I talked about food a couple of minutes ago, I didn't say that we are studying just food, I said that we are studying other food systems. And this is something like, uh, this is just a way how to hide the notion of complexity. Mainly, there, there has been a, a turn a couple of years ago in science saying that things aren't simple. If you are studying, for example, bread, it isn't just bread that you are studying, you are actually studying farmer who is producing bread, you are studying consumer who is eating bread, you are studying somebody who provided agrochemicals to actually support the farmer, you are studying shopping mall who has particular size of shelves that are selling to consumers. So there's all sort of different people within this one study of bread. And basically, if you want to make sure that somebody in this system acts differently, you cannot just go to consumer and say, like, look, you have to behave differently. Because actually, there is a whole system that depends and is closely linked. So you have to change the system. You have to make sure that all these different actors are suddenly behaving differently. So in the case of bread, if you want to bake a new bread, you need to make sure that there are new, maybe, baking uh, ovens in the processing facilities, that there are new shelves in processing uh, in the retail chains, that their consumers actually recognize this type of bread. 
and maybe that farmers are growing new type of wheat. So basically, there are all types of change. So that, that's the challenge. If you want to make sure that farmers are suddenly positioned in the supply chain differently, you cannot talk just with farmers. You suddenly have to talk with a whole bunch of different actors, including some of which don't actually represent food system anymore. Like, for example, banks who have stakes almost in every possible system that you can envision. So, uh, uh, we basically translated in the, this particular challenge in four different claims. First being that we cannot uh, simultaneously communicate with all possible actors that, that are there. It's just there are too many of them. Secondly, even if we would manage to communicate with all of them, they actually hold very different truths. So, for example, think about somebody who is processing, who has processing facilities, and somebody who is actually farming. They actually have very different issues that they are facing daily, and they have very different perspective on where, for example, state funds should go. They have very different perspective on who is a good guy in the supply chain and who is a bad guy in the supply chain. But even then, if we would recognize all these different truths in the, the supply chain, then unfortunately, these truths tend to differ depending on where you actually are. For example, in Latvia, where you have very scarcely populated the rural countryside, farmers will have one si a set of problems. But then when you go to Netherlands, it's a completely different story because suddenly there are 13 times more uh, people per, uh, per square kilometer, which means that land is a completely different uh, issue. And so these farmers will have completely different set of issues that they will face daily. And finally, even if you manage to resolve all of these issues, you still need to overcome the problems that not all of these people will be willing to listen to you. Like quite a few of them will just say like, you are a scientist and you probably don't know anything. So just go away and we will do the things as we uh, have done, it, done usually. So our way out of this challenge was basically to, to create a network, to create a network of people who know, who are located in their local environment, who know this local environment, who represent all of the supply chain, and who would be willing to talk with us. And uh, our goal was to make sure that, that we actually communicate what we know to them, and then to enable them to communicate them with their local communities. Basically, we translated it into five different uh, uh, statements. First of all, we need to find the right people uh, sort of, uh, from all across Europe, from different parts of the supply chain, and invite them to join our network. Secondly, uh, we need to, to make sure that they feel engaged, that they are willing to actually communicate with us, which might sound very simple, but then sort of it might be quite complicated because uh, you have to make a pitch that actually is appealing to very diverse crowd. Then it's not just about making sure that they are engaged, uh, are feeling engaged initially. It's also making sure that they feel engaged all through the process. So you just cannot just develop initial calls, which is interesting, and then sort of forget about it. You have to constantly be very vigilant on what actually this crowd of people is uh, caring about. And uh, sort of, and finally, um, we have to make sure that these people are constantly getting what they want. So they are interested in other cutting edge knowledge, cutting edge knowledge. So we make, have to make sure that we are providing that. And so we have to create mechanisms that allow us to collect this cutting edge knowledge and provide it to this uh, group of people. Uh, apart from that, and next slide is the one where I have kept too many texts and I realize it now, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, but as, as I said, I'm scientist through and through and sort of uh, I already deleted half of what I have written yesterday. So, <laughs> so this is uh, the small portion of text. Uh, sort of uh, finally, it's very clear that we cannot do it alone. And when I'm saying we, I mean the institute where I'm working, the universities that I represent. Sort of, although we have all the competencies to do that, we still need support. We need support from, from all across the Europe because we need local knowledge. We need support from different types of actors because we need to understand what they are thinking and what's relevant to them. So we constantly, we can think about our people that we want to engage to, to make sure that our communication works, but then we also have to attract partners that would be willing to, to host this network together with us. So these were the issues that we were facing. And uh, I think that we did quite well in trying to 
well, not trying, but to overcoming them. So because of the network is running for, for three years now, and so far we have been, I think, quite successful in making sure that, that it generates at least some results. So the first thing, uh, as I said, was to making sure that we have the right people. And for that, we need to have the right call. Basically, we need to reach out to the right people, and we need to make sure that the offer that we are giving them is appealing and, and sort of uh, ticks the boxes of what they would expect from, from a network like this. Uh, so what we did, we basically put together, uh, as, uh, we made a short survey of what these activists were, might want to ask to offer them, and then we sort of create an offer according to these things that they mentioned that are appealing to them. Namely, we offered uh, a, a networking possibility, a, a possibility for recognition, small funds for new businesses if they want to, and also mentorship if they develop their own businesses. And uh, to be honest, we didn't receive a very high number of applications. We received, we were planning to go for a network of 40 people, but we received 60 applications. But these were applications of what I would describe, like people have been describing that I am overachiever. But then I read these applications and I realized, no, I haven't done anything with my life. So I have been lazy. So we have received uh, 16 applications of overachievers, like really overachievers. Uh, they, all of them had already a number of projects in their pockets. They have uh, done quite many things to change their local food systems and they had extensive networks. This made, of course, our life very difficult because we had uh, secured funds for 40 people. But sort of it also made us very happy because we knew that when we will end up with these 40 people, we will have somebody who really cares, who can spread our message. Uh, so sort of a very quick demographic profile on what we got from this network. So we were aiming to make sure that there is well, somewhat equal gender gap, sort of that there are equal uh, number of male and female, uh, that uh, there is um, uh, that there is a tangible tendency that more of these people are, are young and, and sort of uh, more between 20s and 30s and this is what we got and so far uh, how we organize it we, we had a couple of trainings that you I will explain a little bit later what it means these trainings and we are having a bunch of online events for where people can just learn on different issues that they might find interesting and uh, so so far we have had two of these trainings we will have the third training in a couple of weeks in Riga and uh, it, it's normal what we observe that this network isn't static, it's changing. So after the first training, we witnessed that a couple of people dropped out, some of new people came in, and now again we see that a couple of people are dropping out and some are coming in. And uh, some of them like realize that that's not for them being a part of the network. Some of them have other priorities and sort of things that they would want to work with these different priorities. Like for example, we had this one person who was invited to engage with a movie in Hollywood and we thought well of course he chose the movie in Hollywood and not us because well that's just uh, unfair comparison between the network and the possibility to be a star in Hollywood and uh, in terms of um, uh, of representation we have successfully managed to build this network where we see all Europe we, we haven't had a couple of major agricultural countries at the beginning but we are because the network is slightly changing all the, then we have a possibility to observe whom we still miss and then whenever a new spot is open we can look and actually fill this particular spot so we initially we didn't had anybody from France now we have a person from France and I know that's a minor detail but for us it was just very important to make sure that we have this pan European coverage and that we are later on communicating in different European languages. So this is regarding how we are recruiting them, then how we are maintaining interest. And uh, I said we have a number of seminars but then we are having these large trainings and of course one huge carrot that we can offer and that we budgeted very early is so that since we are looking for younger people, probably they would enjoy traveling around. So let's allocate a little bit of money for traveling and let's allow them to travel all together. That will be a nice experience and that actually will be a substantial carrot for them to join and to actually stay in the network. That have cost, that has been probably the main expense in our network to, to actually organize these events all around Europe. But that's been also super fun for us and it actually have made sense because uh, as I said, local food systems differ. So by traveling around, we can show examples, we can organize excursions in different environments and just show what it means across Europe to actually 
produce food, to actually consume food, and to, to maintain the supply chain. So we had the first training uh, more than a year ago in Brussels, and we had next in Spain. Uh, looking now back, I think the lesson learned is that you shouldn't organize your uh, first event in Brussels because that's so expensive that uh, sort of it's difficult to organize a high quality event for, for the pennies that we plan for, for that. Uh, but yeah, it, it's also a lesson learned and I think if we will have to do it again, we will have a lot of uh, insights on how to improve for that. And, uh, so the, but it's not only having these excursions or having this traveling around because clearly that's one of the most important thing for them but it's also they have applied to, to gain knowledge. And very early we started to monitor what is it that actually they are looking to get out of this uh, uh, network. And uh, we conducted our first sur survey when we asked them to apply. Then we conducted again one survey asking what they want after the first training. After the second training we did the same thing. And there are this group of things that are constantly repeating. Um, firstly, they are looking for networking. And this is what we are supporting just by uh, bringing them together, by allowing them to travel around, we are making sure that they are networking. Uh, they want to, well, well, not surprisingly, they want to have excursions, and uh, which again might sound just as a fun thing to, to do, but it makes sense to see how people are doing the same things elsewhere in different locations. So we are also keeping in mind that no matter what we do, we try to organize for our ambassadors excursions so they see what, uh, how different contexts look like. Uh, they want to support their own businesses. So that's what we call co-creation. We, sort of, we try to look at what they do and may try to resolve their problems by showing what could work better and by showing these good examples. And we are providing just uh, what we call training, which is a small part of, of uh, the training in general, where we are providing newest insights from, from research, what uh, we have collected and what our colleagues have done. In practice, that's much more fun. Sort of, it's not so static as you might seem. It's, it's sort of some of these are lectures, some of these is this usual competition of strengths of whenever a group of males come together, sort of just testing who is stronger. Uh, and in the third picture, you see that by the third day, some of our ambassadors felt so exhausted that they just fell asleep during an excursion. Apparently, that was because they were partying until three or four, and then they realized that in the particular city, taxis stopped working at 12. So they got stuck in the city center. But yeah, so people have fun and people learn, and, and that allows us to reach out to, to different contexts and actually spread our message. But also to, to make sure that everybody is on board and that we are tapping into what ambassadors expect from us, we, we know that we constantly have to follow up on, on how well they have done. And so we can, so what we do, we constantly monitor their expectations and, and sort of try to work out what we have done good and what we have done wrong. And of course, these, these data that we have cannot be interpreted as, as trends. These are just points at, in time where we see that something is happening. Still, these points of, in time are very um, help us to, to do our work better and to prepare next trainings. And also, on top of that, we are also have to monitor what we have done with our partners, so, so how happy they feel when they engage with uh, Ambassadors Network. So that's basically what we are doing. I'm, I think I will stop here. Um, I had one more slide, but that's quite, I know I have this slide. So I, I think, as I said, for us, it has been a success. We have been doing it for three years, and we are quite happy where we are with that. And uh, I think what what um, what have helped to achieve and to build this network is that we have this very strong group of partners that allows us to maintain this network. Uh, we are constantly reflecting and collecting data on how ambassadors feel about what they are doing, uh, what we are doing, and sort of trying to react on that. Uh, we are trying to listen to all of the groups that are involved and sort of trying to tweak our own actions regarding on, on what we hear from them. And we very early realized that this will need money. And sort of we have allocated this money and uh, sort of we could have paid our salaries for that or we could have bought some, some inventory, but we realized that if we want to have a network, we have to allocate money for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel. You can hold on to uh, the microphone for now because we will still have questions for you. Okay. <laughs> As I said, I'm not a motivational speaker. 
I'm a scientist. I think you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> so my question, my question for you is that it sounds like you're, you've prioritized giving a lot of value to your ambassadors, and it sounds like you're doing that very successfully. How have you been able to extract value from having this network of ambassadors? Well, there are a number of ways how we benefit from that. Uh, starting that, um, first of all, we want to see change. And we have been uh, sort of uh, also introducing very early funds, not really large funds, but, but sort of funds for people to do something new in their local environment. And then through the time when we are running this network, we are supporting them with advice. We are supporting them with uh, uh, different examples. We are supporting basically with research evidence on how they could improve what they are doing. And that, that has been extremely successful, I would say. We have had six uh, new initiatives developed, and all of them are running for three years, and, and sort of they are continuing to, to improve. And, and sort of some of them have been completely new ways, for example, for example to produce new products or, or to, to sort of uh, to open new cooperatives that together sell something. And some of them have built on already existing processing facilities and sort of developed label and tried to push it in the local communities. But that's not the only way how we are benefiting from that because we are also sort of whenever we get new results, it's better to test it with practitioners. So what we are doing, we are basically presenting any new results that we are having uh, to our ambassadors, and then we discuss what it means and what of that is applicable, and, and how we could transform these results to actually push them into the community. And finally, we are, well, as researchers, we are constantly in the search of new topics. And that's very helpful when you have 40 people who are really eager to, to change something, they're constantly coming up with new topics. So, so that has helped us to, to actually keep uh, being relevant, and also just to, to have this list of different uh, issues that we could explore. Perfect, thank you. And my next question for you is how, when you decided to issue the call for ambassadors, how did you make sure that your call reached the people that you wanted in your network? Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm eager to answer. That was pure luck, but of course it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, that was, there was a couple of steps how we actually ensured. First of all, uh, as I said, networks of partners are important. And sort of what we did, we basically activated the networks that we had and we said, well, it would really help if you could just recommend two people. And it, well, not everybody responded, but, but those that did, they recommended two people, and together when you activate all of them, you actually have already quite a substantial pool of people who are interested. But then also, it's uh, like we are not the only network out there. We are, the, I would say, one of the most active, but, but there are so many networks of uh, rural development, food transition, and things like that. And, and most of them are already sort of well established and have uh, lists of potential uh, well, people operating in these networks. So we just actually reached out to those and said, please spread the information and, and maybe somebody will be interested. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience here? Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, you said you are not a, a motivational speaker, but you motivated these many ambassadors, so that's good. Uh, my question was, uh, you are a researcher, but just to uh, enable these ambassadors to work in this field, you must have to be learning something different as well. Maybe uh, like learn how to make a team, how to work in a team, or how like learn a new language or something like that. So you, did you have to learn something new to do all this other than your research? Thank you. Well, uh, although I'm saying that I'm a researcher, I'm not only researcher. I had had experience in advertising and in marketing, uh, and that was prior to, to That explains so much. <laughs> uh, but uh, on top of that, I, I completely agree that a lot of that is uh, just looking, sort of taking a step back there. From my perspective, there has been a turn in European scientific uh, uh, space uh, where especially in social sciences where much of the research is going not so much in just exploring, but also in in engaging in participatory different methods and in ensuring that, that there is this constant uh, 
um, engagement of different author groups. And this has facilitated that there has been this really huge boom of different methods that support that. And, and the thing is that not all of the researchers actually are, are very eager to explore these new methods, but they are there. And they are really, you. if you are at least a little bit open, you can find. And that has been a tremendous part of our work to just to, to go through these new methods and actually check which of those we can use. Because, well, as I said, these ambassadors aren't so much looking just for lectures. They are looking very much for experiences. And then these new methods actually allow us to generate these experiences. Does it answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, it doesn't look like we do. I mean, I have a lot of other questions about, for example, how did you decide from the very beginning that you wanted to create this ambassador network? What was the thinking and the rationale behind that? Well, we have a long experience with science communication. And, uh, and it's really difficult to try to reach out to groups that are not really eager and then to negotiate between different groups that have very different perspectives and trying to find the middle grounds between them. And then we thought that if we would actually manage to bring these people together and, and then talk on, on somewhere outside of their daily environment, that that would help us. And also, as I said, the systems that we are working with, and actually most of scientists uh, that are working in social science, I, I think, experience the same thing, is that the society is very complex, that it's, where it has so many different opinions, and it's really difficult to communicate with all of these groups simultaneously. So I think it, it makes sense to, to actually bring out the most active of those and, and sort of start the conversation with those that are willing to, to talk, that have already network, and actually convince them to be part of your communication network. And actually, it's not that we have come up with the idea. I think NASA does the same thing. It's just that we do it low key. <laughs> So, so really, it's just copying NASA. It's as simple as that, everyone. You heard it here first. That, that sounds very like <laughs> arrogant. I wouldn't say that we are, we are doing it half of what they are doing. But sort of, I, I think that basically it, it is that, that we are not the only ones that are, have noticed this trend that, that you need to actually get involved with people who are interested in your research. And it makes things so much easier. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Another round of applause for Mitchell. Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you.